Hey, everybody. Um, thanks for being here tonight. Happy to talk to all of you guys about um, my green career, I guess. Um, so my name is Laura Spencer Humphrey. I am the Director of Sustainability at LM Development Partners. LM is uh, an impact-driven, vertically integrated developer, builder, and manager, primarily of affordable multifamily buildings in New York City, although not only in New York. Um, and we also develop um, and manage mixed use um, uh, and, and some commercial buildings as well. Um, one of the interesting things about the company and one of the reasons why I was attracted to work here is that it is vertically integrated. So we are really there through the whole life cycle of our buildings. Um, we have development teams. Um, we have in-house builders and pre-con um, team. We have our asset management as well as our property management. So from a sustainability perspective, um, it's, it's a great opportunity to be able to see and work um, kind of holistically with the building throughout its life cycle. Um, my role is actually a new one for the company. So for folks who are in like the New York City real estate world, um, you know, l and I think has been recognized as a leader in uh, green development. Um, so it's sort of surprising to people to learn that this role is a new one for the company. Um, and I think, you know, part of it is um, about thinking about how can we move sustainability um, beyond, you know, beyond kind of like specific projects that it's being implemented on, like development projects, and really thinking about it holistically. Um, so with my specific role, I'm, I'm really like defining it now in a lot of ways, but there's three main areas that I'm, that I kind of toggle between. Um, the first is setting kind of the sustainability agenda for the company. So this is about, you know, setting goals, milestones, establishing the strategy that we're going to undertake to achieve those things. Um, and as a result of that, you know, the second area is around running sustainability initiatives, generally at the business line or at the organizational level. So examples of a business line initiative, particularly regarding um, building electrification, would be, you know, around um, supporting efforts to um, ensure that uh, developments that we're working on are going to be credibly net zero. Um, another one could be around, you know, a lot of my background is around retrofit. And so looking at our existing portfolio and thinking about how to decarbonize the, you know, 400 plus buildings that we have, um, that are, um, primarily running on fossil fuel because they were largely built, you know, prior to 2000. Um, so what's the retrofit strategies and what are the initiatives that we can, can put in place to get there? Um, and then the third area is supporting sustainability efforts at specific projects. So, you know, we, we have certain development projects that are very complex um, and there may be like areas where I get involved, whether it's around, you know, um, vehicle electrification, thermal electrification, um, or other sustainability considerations that I might kind of get, get in the mix. Um, you know, I mentioned before that l and is seen um, as a leader in sustainable real estate, particularly for affordable housing. And I think that has a lot to do with a push kind of spurred in large part due to the gas moratoriums that were happening in New York City a number of years ago, um, or that were kind of um, uh, prior to the current legislation, the CLCPA, there was some, um, you know, uh, re like regional specific gas moratoriums, and that really spurred the company to think differently about how they were using fossil fuels on their sites. And that really opened the doors to kind of push past, um, you know, uh, green building, thinking about it specifically about energy efficiency and really towards electrification. So um, particularly like kind of shifting from kind of the more traditional like lead energy star buildings to passive house, um, shifting from gas, you know, thermal systems, even though really efficient and, and cutting edge ones at the time 
to um, electric thermal options. Um, no, name, you know, one of the areas that we're most comfortable with and that we've done a lot of work with even in New York City is geothermal. Um, so that's a little bit of background kind of on the company and, and my role here. Um, a little bit about my background prior to joining LNM. So I joined, um, when was it, in March this year? So it's all still pretty new. Um, but one thing I was really excited about this role is that it really allowed me to kind of bring together all the major elements of my background prior. And that kind of falls into like two categories. One is sort of is decarbonization strategy that I was doing um, for utilities and actually private sector companies as a consultant, um, especially um, companies that have significant portfolios of real estate. Um, and kind of surprisingly, you know, just the way that a lot of um, industries are headed um, when we think about real estate in the private sector, it's a lot. It's a lot of healthcare, and then it's more and more, you know, kind of on the um, the, the investor side that a lot of uh, private companies are moving away from owning real assets. So, kind of like an interesting little note if you're thinking about carbon strategy <laughs> at that level. Um, so that's what I was doing prior to this job, and then before that. I was really deep in the um, uh, energy efficiency and energy initiatives and programs, uh, market transformation programs at the state, city, and kind of utility level. So I worked for with NYSERDA, um, which is the New York State entity on um, on energy and, and decarbonization. Um, I also worked with ICF um, as a consultant to um, both the, as it was then known, the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, um, as well as the Joint Utilities, Con Edison and other utilities on designing and deploying their energy efficiency, demand response and electrification programs. Um, so I get to kind of think about that kind of programmatic level, like how do we get large portfolios of buildings to do something, <laughs> um, as well as kind of pairing that with kind of a corporate strategy perspective around decarbonization as well. Um, I also, oh yeah. I was gonna say, Laura, um, you know, just kind of reviewing bios of each of our speakers, uh, Christina has also worked with the uh, electrification strategies. You mentioned, of course, decarbonization, but uh, she worked with electrification strategies. Are there any overlap between, you know, those who work specifically in decarbonization versus electrification? Are they kind of synonymous? Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a good point. So I think when we think about um, real estate, you know, um, the built environment, um, for the most part, you know, the, the, hard, the hardest carbon to tackle there is the thermal, um, is the carbon resulting from thermal. Not to say that you know electric loads are perfectly easy, but you have a lot of options. Whether it's you know on-site PV to off-site procurement, and then of course, especially in New York, we can anticipate that the grid is getting a lot cleaner um, by the time that most of our organizations need to achieve our climate goals. Um, so the hardest nut to crack is what are you what are you doing with the gas that's heating your buildings? <laughs> you know. Um, and so that in that way, I think it's not an entirely synonymous. Carbon is bigger than than just kind of the electrification of thermal and um, and uh, and transportation needs. But that's a lot of what, what I'm tackling on a day to day basis. And then if you don't mind, right, I was just going to propose a question to Christina on this very topic. Um, what is the biggest thing you believe that we need to tackle based off of kind of some things that Laura mentioned, but also using your, you know, where you work, like, what do you have to say about your biggest thing to tackle for New York City? Sure. I mean, specifically when it comes to building electrification, which is what mm -hmm. I work in, um, I mean, I would say one of the largest barriers that, that not only New York City faces, but across the board is just the cost, who's going to, you know, bear this cost, um, given that it is more expensive in some cases than, than its, you know, gas counterpart. Um, and also, even if we were able to, to, you know, solve the upfront cost battle, there's also 
the chance that operating costs might increase. And, and that's especially dangerous um, for communities that are facing, you know, energy burden or, or any type of affordability issue. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of, of, you know, there's also like technical barriers. There's a lot when it comes to electrification, but I would say that in general, I think what, cons what has, um, what's most concerning is especially from like an equity lens for us is just cost. Mm -hmm. And really quickly, if you don't mind, uh, can you introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Um, uh, I'm like a full intro, like Laura's or just like, um, yeah, like a full intro. Yeah. Let's do a full intro and I'm kind of going to purposely hop back and forth. Okay. Speakers, okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, hey all also just really grateful to be here, um, and, and share my story. Um, always love the opportunity to, to be able to share like a career trajectory. Um, yeah story. So I'm Christina Garcia, a native New Yorker. I'm from Queens. Um, and I right now am the deputy director at the Building Electrification Institute. So we are an organization that uh, assists local city government um, with the transition away from fossil fuels in their buildings. So specifically through building electrification. We work with 12 cities across the country. New York City is one of them, um, which is awesome. And yeah, I mean, we we really try to meet cities where they are. So there's no, you know, silver bullet or or main offering. Um, we really try to help cities with with whatever it is they need to, to help accelerate the transition. We my focus day to day is is particularly on what that transition means in terms of labor and workforce development, um, but also how we bring in more communities to be part of program and policy design and implementation. Um, I also, I, I came from the New York City Mayor's Office of Sustainability. That was my previous role. Um, at, yeah, in terms of intro, I think that's it. Oh, you're muted. Oh, there's always one. Um, <laughs> and then before we really deep, deep dive into the conversation, uh, let's have best for last, Eric if you don't mind giving us a brief introduction as well. Um, hi, everyone. I'm having issues with my videos, so um, please excuse me. So uh, Eric Sanchez, um, <clears throat> also a native New Yorker from Brooklyn, New York. Um, I've been in the industry, the HVAC industry for 25 years. Um, started right out of high school, um, took this two year course of HVAC and refrigeration um, at the time. Um, couldn't decided not to go to college. I wanted to pursue a, a trade career. And I was fortunate enough to know a lot of people in the industry, um, construction as well, plumbing, electrical. So um, I work currently for Daikin um, North America. We, for people that know, don't know anything about Daikin, we are the global leader um, in producing HVAC equipment. And um, I work for a small department that it's focused on New York City and helping all of our engineers when they're doing a project and they have mechanical equipment that needs to go in there and they're considering doing um, high efficiency equipment like what we call VRF or VRV, which is, stands for variable refrigerant flow. We work together, we design, we engineer the, 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 the project for them uh, everything that has to do with piping, electrical, ventilation, um, and we follow obviously all of the uh, local codes, uh, mechanical code, um, and it's it's a it's a you know it it takes a while, but it, we work together with them, and I've been with them for about a year and a half now. But prior to joining Daikin, um, again, like I said, twenty five years in the industry, I started like a lot of people did, you know, doing service and, you know, installs and commissioning. And, and then I became uh, like a field supervisor, service manager, you know, office manager, general manager. So it been in the HVAC in industry for, for the entire 25 years. And I, I've had the opportunity to, to learn a little bit of everything. And it's, I really enjoy what I do because doing HVAC, you have your hands in a lot of different things. Um, and, Obviously, what we're discussing right now, it's very important because HVAC, it's it's one of those things that we have to we have to attack 
uh, in terms of electrification and decarbonization. And, and Daikin is, is at the forefront of, of producing equipment that is going to help reduce carbon emissions and all of the goals that we have in New York City as well. Thank you, Eric. Um... You know, uh, you know, unlike Laura and Christina, you you actually started, you know, in the service, you know, of HVACs and other things like that. You know, what is your advice to people who want to maybe not go to college and maybe go to a service school? Because, you know, everyone has their opinions and everyone mm -hmm. does something different, but I want to hear more about you know, why, how, what would be your advice to someone else who wishes to take your path? Yeah, I mean, it, I would never, never say that, that going to college is not a good thing. Obviously, I, I went back to college later on in my, <laughs> okay. in my life. But right. at, at the time, you know, I was looking for a trade and, and I, I wanted to be a part of something that was going, going to allow me to do different things. And, um, so my recommendation is for, I mean, there's a lot of people that, I know a lot of people out there that are very good with their hands and they want to work in construction or they want to do electrical or plumbing and, and they just don't know exactly where to go. I mean, there's several schools in, in, in New York and Jersey that people can attend, but um, I mean, it, obviously it's, it's a good trade for people to join, but there's more to do, you know, especially what we're talking about right now, electrification and decarbonization. HVAC is not the only, the only career. I mean, with, with all of the different things that are, we're doing now, we're gonna have solar, obviously wind, we have biomass, uh, the oil industry, the gas industry, uh, nuclear industry. I mean, there's a lot of different things that people can join. Uh, but for people that actually are thinking about joining something like this, it's, it's, there's several options. Somebody wants to talk to me about things like that. I'm more than happy to talk. Um, companies like Daikin, Carrier, Mitsubishi, everybody offers different trainings, different ways to get into the industry. So um, I can join, I, I mean, I can share all that information with people that want to, they want to know more about it as well. Sure to unmute myself. Um, thank you. And uh, speaking of which, um, you know, Laura, if you don't mind me asking as well, what made you want to get your master's in management and sustainability? Do you think it was something that you found necessary or is it something you wanted to do? Did it maybe coincide well with having a moment of respite from work? Um, I'm always very curious what, you know, I've been in school a very, very long time and I'm frankly done. But it would be nice to know, like, when is it valuable to maybe get that degree, get said accreditation, get certification? What was your experience like? Yeah, so I actually got my degree part time, like while I was working um, at ICF. So I didn't really do it as a way to um, change my career. It was more about kind of deepening my knowledge and my skills um, in ways that, you know, um, I, I felt like I was kind of missing some pieces because I transitioned to, um, to, to this chosen field like later in my career. Um, and so I felt like I, I learned everything on the job. <laughs> and so maybe it was time to learn things like formally <laughs> um, for once. So um, that was the main reason why I decided to go to grad school. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, grad school and the use of it is really different for everybody. So I don't mm -hmm. think one, you know, per one perfect reason to go or one, you know, like perfect environment to go. I think my only counsel to folks who ask me about that is, that, is to have a very clear idea of what you want to get out of it. Mm -hmm. um, I think just kind of going to school, just to go to school um, and to learn things, you know, can be great, but then you, but you may not get what you were hoping to get out of it. So I think grad school is a great idea. If you have a specific idea, I'm going to go to school to do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like a panacea in and of itself. Yeah, no, I, I hear that quite often too, but also on the contrary, in a, in a different way, I hear people where it's like, I'm not exactly sure how this is going to play out, but I do know that this is the right path for me for X, Y, Z reasons. So um, thank you for that. 
And then additionally, for all three speakers, whoever wants to chime in first to answer this question, um, what current project are we all working at our respective jobs? Maybe not project, but what is, what is giving you the most heartache right now at your jobs as far as maybe a project or a pitch or something? And how are you all reacting and managing that at work? Of course, in the lens of what we're talking about, building electrification, um, any takers? Sure, I'm happy to go. Um, I, I think this is just a challenge that most people face if they're working in electrification is, you know, there isn't like a silver bullet solution. I mean, I guess, especially for my line of work, which is more like policy um, around electrification for cities, there isn't really a silver bullet bullet, especially when it comes to existing buildings. Um, so although that, I guess, does cause some heartache, it also provides a, a very, I think, unique opportunity to be really creative and collaborative with stakeholders um, and different types of stakeholders that hold like different expertise within, you know, within building electrification and, and the impacts of building electrification. So yeah, I mean, it's it's tough, but I would say how I'm dealing with it is just leaning into that and, and recognizing that this makes room for, for a really collaborative setting. Um, and so, you know, being a convener, uh, being a facilitator for those types of conversations um, is, yeah, is how I take it. Yeah, and as someone from the comments, there's no silver bullet from a technical perspective either, right? buildings are, are unique. Um, so there's a lot of challenges, but again, I think everyone can align that this is some part of the solution in the climate fight. So working collaboratively uh, to try to get there. Awesome, thank you. And thank you, Brent, right? Um, these are the things, you know, it's worth talking about and it's worth bringing up. So thank you. Yeah, something else that um, comes up um, for us, you know, in, in what we're doing, in New York City, we have um, something called Local Law 97. A lot of people are, you know, very familiar with that. And, you know, the first date, which is 2024, is coming up pretty soon. Um, and, you know, we, we talk with a lot of building owners and the people are concerned about the fines that they're going to get if they don't get to a certain criteria. Um, obviously, a lot of the buildings that we work on, you know, pre-war buildings, you name it, there's a lot of challenges to, to get them where they need to be. Uh, but the good thing is that building owners, people are really buying into it and doing what they need to do. So it, I guess the challenge is, is the fact that now we're up against the clock, you know, and trying to do a lot of these things with the buildings. Um, and people are not understanding really what they need to do. So they, they, they need help. And, and this is where we come in. And you know, trying to to help them, whether it's changing their mechanical equipment into something that is more efficient, or attacking the building in a different way, just to get to that first step for 2024, and then from there on, you know, we know that the goal is to lower the emissions by 80 percent by 2050, which is you know 28 years from now. Um, so obviously, our hands are full. We're going to have a lot of things to do, a lot of jobs that are going to be open for people that want to join, and and help us achieve those goals. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, there is one question that I will address uh, specifically for Christina here in a moment, but just with what Eric had to say, weird question, but how do building owners, building managers, whoever is in charge of said building, right? Are there um, trainings, publications to kind of educate the other um, operators of the building on the reasons for Local Law 97? And then Additionally, a second question is, you know, who exactly monitors said building is on track, another said building is on track, or is it a pretty autonomous process where every building out for themselves? I've always been curious about that as someone who just recently moved back to New York City. I think it's all being run through the Department of Buildings um, and through, and then the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice has um, a program called the New York City Accelerator that has tons of educational and outreach um, 
uh, resources, um, both like kind of online training as well as like one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, support that people can get, that building owners, operators, property managers can get. Um, yeah, but the, but I, my understanding is that DOB um, in the city is tracking the emissions and deciding the fines and all that kind of stuff. Wow. But I think it all roots in local I-84, which is the benchmarking law. Benchmarking law. Okay. Yeah, that's like the core of it, but there's other stuff that goes on top of it. It's good that all those local laws kind of talk to each other. So that makes, that is ringing a bell with me. Um, okay, so real quick question for Christina. Uh, I'd be interested to hear how you shifted your career from an engineering role to a policy role. Sure. Um... Yeah, well, so when I graduated, which I also went for my master's in engineering, um, and when I graduated, I could not get a job in, in sustainability. And I think that was mostly because I didn't have internships under my belt, which is something else that I think, you know, people in school should, should try to get internships because it really can determine like that first job you get, um, which obviously determines like subsequent jobs. Um, but I, ha I had a hard time and I ended up working construction for a couple of years. So I was following the more traditional kind of engineering route, working for construction in New York City um, as an engineer. But I knew that, and, and at the time, it felt like construction and climate change were, or, you know, sustainability were two very separate things. Actually, now I feel like those two are, are starting to merge more because of local legislation, which is forcing, you know, construction to be built in a certain way um, and for existing buildings to, to, to meet these caps and all of that. But at the time, it felt like two very separate things um, and that I wouldn't be able to pursue kind of my passion for, for being part of, um, you know, climate change solution in New York City. So, it, yeah, I interviewed a lot to try to get out of the construction world. Um, and I finally, you know, luckily because I knew someone and they were able to, to provide me, to help me get this interview, I was able to interview and, and, and then end up getting a job at the mayor's office. So um, a couple of things about that is one, I think that at the time, and I, and I still meet young people in engineering who feel like there's this huge disconnect between engineering and policy. Um, but there really isn't, especially when we're talking about building electrification, which is a, a real technical thing. I think these two kind of professions need to work really closely together. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that there is more and more kind of acknowledgement of that, that engineering and policy are, should not, not be speaking to one another. Um, we should have engineers working in policy, um, and we should have people with policy backgrounds that are maybe more involved in um, engine, like typical engineering firms that work closely in, you know, with cities. Um, the, the other thing that I, I think is like oftentimes with, with young people, like panels like these where people share kind of their windy career trajectories are really useful so that people can see themselves in these career paths. Because I definitely never would have thought that I would, would have ended up in like a policy role while I was doing, you know, while I was studying, um, engineering. So yeah, these, these kind of things are so critical so that people yeah, can see themselves um, and see what, what careers are out there, especially in sustainability where there's constantly evolving and like new careers that I think bring together these like different um, backgrounds. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and kind of touching upon one of the questions in the chat, you know, Likewise, how important is it, right, for maybe policymakers or those people that typically, you know, th think and work with a building holistically, how important is it for them to kind of understand the equipment and the nitties and gritties and the blueprints and stuff? What is anyone's opinion on kind of like the reverse? Uh, I think, or, sorry, I can go again, but I think, you know, the people that I work with, we all have a pretty deep understanding of the equipment and like the technical barriers um, because we're helping city staff think through, you know, policy or programs to support this effort. And I think that requires having, yeah, a pretty deep understanding. Um, but I, I would say that's like relative to maybe the, to most people working in this space. 
However, we are not like in the weeds engineers thinking about, you know, coefficients of performances at like certain degrees, right? And I don't think that everyone needs to be that level of expert when thinking through how do we advance this like major issue. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think everyone needs to be an expert. There are experts for that. Although I do think that like, when we're thinking about like the specific topic, but also just kind of like lots of sustainability topics, not just around electrification, um, that I think some of the people that are the most successful are either, you know, whether they're coming in from an engineering background or coming at it from another background, but are able to cross and, mm -hmm. and talk to the other side. There's always going to be like the policy people, the and a lot. I mean, you know, sustainability and electrification. You have to think about, and Christine was mentioning before, like technical stuff, workforce, communities, resiliency. I mean, there's like a million different things that you that kind of come together here when you think about buildings. Um, some of it technical, some of it, you know, or all of it's technical in different ways. Not all of it is like engineering technical, but you have to be able to talk across all of that. So I think that like, I really, I'm not an engineer, but I really love working with engineers and kind of like creating that um, when you can, when you find that collaboration, that's where like the best policy comes from. That's where the best program design comes from and things like that. So I think that's a really important aspect. Like either way you're kind of slicing it, communication, collaboration, you know, with people who might come at it a problem, like diametrically opposed to you, you know, in terms of approach is really, really important. And um, speaking of which, right, Eric has started his career in service and maintenance, and now he's the business development manager, right, at Daikin. So for you, Eric, what is it like when you're speaking with the Christinas, right? You're speaking with the Lauras, or likewise, you're speaking with past Eric, when you're dealing with your HVAC projects and everything you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, one, what is that like? And then two, you know, how have you changed since you were in your previous shoes? Yeah, um, you know, I, I agree with what Laura was saying. There has to be some um, communication between the two because um, that's, that's one thing that, to answer your question about me changing over the years, um, for people that want to join, let's just say HVAC, right? You know, anyone can do HVAC. Anyone can do an installation. Anyone can try to say, all right, I'm going to give you cold or hot air, but that's not it. That's just not what we're trying to do. There's a lot more. So if there's, if we don't have an understanding of how a building works, you know, um, building envelope, you know, building science, how our system is going to affect that, then we're just one of the many out there doing an installation or selling something to a consumer that eventually is not going to be happy. So it, it to me is very interesting because as I said before, you know, I didn't go to college at the beginning of my career, but then I went back to college later on. So it's it's I can see the connection between the two of them and it speaking to people that are just joining the field, it's always interesting to to hear how they say, well, you know, we can always do it following rule of thumbs, but it, it, that's that's not going to work anymore, especially not with what we're trying to do. We have to have a deep understanding, or at least some of it, so that both can communicate. I see a common thread, and this is good, and I'm actually getting very good feedback on the Q&A, so thanks, Tracy. Thanks, everyone. And I do have one question that popped up, so hang tight. So for Christina... Coming from a construction background, this is coming from Raj V, and I apologize if I butchered your name, I will get it corrected here shortly. Um, what is your opinion on the need of green building materials and opting for more sustainable options, replacing cement, considering it's a major source of emissions? Do you think enforcement of policy around the same can help? That's a great question. Um, and I did not work in that specifically when I worked um, in construction, but yeah, I mean, I think overall we should be achieve we should be trying to achieve um, you know more sustainable material and, and and have that more and more become the norm. However, kind of like electrification, we need the experts to to work collaboratively to to understand like how that actually makes sense. How is that cost effective? 
um, you know, at what pace can we be integrating these types of materials? So I don't have like specific answers about, you know, material. Um, I don't know enough about those those types of materials, but I think in general, yeah, we should all be trying to move to to better, you know, less carbon intensive material. Um, and we should start having conversations with people that know about that, you know, as soon as possible. Yeah, one thing I want to like add on to the embodied carbon conversation, which is like thinking about the carbon in construction materials, um, is I think it's actually really related to th the way we're thinking about or, or the industry around building electrification in the states right now, especially when we think about retrofitting. I think it's a little bit different for new construction on the electrification side is that, you know, building owners and managers are really being expected to do things to their buildings to make the buildings suited for a future world that current conditions don't support all the time. So Christina mentioned this earlier, like natural gas is really cheap. So it's very hard to make the case to start heating your building with a more expensive energy um, you know, unless you can, unless you, everyone feels super confident that that's going to change in the future. And there's lots of ways in which we're not allowed to, you know, our underwriters won't allow us to, you know, incorporate future fines or, you know, anticipated thoughts about where the market's going to go. Right. So it's really, really hard to do in the retrofit. And I think it's similar with embodied carbon. Like we know we need to get there, but there's no policy support around that really right now. And so while we all know it's a huge, construction materials are a huge carbon contributor globally, um, but because we don't have the right incentives to that, it's really hard to justify the cost, mm -hmm. um, no matter how strong of a believer you are. For all speakers, right, what are there exceptions for these retrofits, right? Are there exceptions because of the supply, you know, various supply chain issues or you know, not just the size of the building, but very special circumstances with maybe size and type and where it's located and who's financing it, right? I can only assume, right, that there are some outliers when it comes to achieving everything we want out of, you know, making New York City completely green and a completely electrified. Any anecdotes on these sort of exceptions? Yeah, one exception, um or I guess one topic that, that constantly comes up for cities when they're thinking about legislation is, you know, whether or not to create an exception for under-resourced buildings. And of course, and that's just a balance and like a really tricky thing because while we do not want to further, you know, energy burden or affordability, displacement, gentrification, all of these things that push, you know, local people out, we don't want to fully exempt them and then not let those same people benefit from all the good things that come with, you know, this energy transition um, and with, you know, ideally holistic retrofits, because there's a lot of benefits that come with that, like improved indoor air quality. Um, you know, again, if it's holistic, then we should be addressing just housing quality. So like lead, asbestos. So it's, it's just tricky because exemption, I don't think is the answer. Um, because again, we want these communities who have been historically most burdened to finally see some of the benefits of this clean energy transition. But that means that we need to be well prepared to provide resources, whether that's funding or supportive programs like the accelerator, things that ensure that these buildings can then comply. Um, otherwise, we will lead to, you know, exacerbating other inequities again by finding them, and that leads to displacement um, and all of these other things that we don't want. So it's tricky, um, but that that's definitely a a group that needs to be like carefully considered and and considered differently than some other, um, you know, folks that that might be impacted by by legislation. Mm -hmm. No, thanks, Christina, for that. Um, I'm going to broaden this conversation out a little bit, and I'm going to start with Eric, and then, of course, um, you know, Laura and Christina can follow shortly after. Um, you know, what makes each of your companies or past companies that you've worked at sustainable? So, you know, what makes Daikin special? Like, what is it that you do that really um, we, you, we can educate our audience here at Green Careers on, you know, what is your selling point for how 
we're electrifying our buildings, how we're sustainable, things of that nature. So Eric, do you mind? Yeah, um, so without getting too technical, um, because we'll be here all night, you know, um, Daikin, Daikin is is the industry leader since 1990, 1982 um, with VRV technology. Uh, for people that don't know what VRV is, uh, basically just an air conditioning that has the ability to modulate the uh, the amount of refrigerant that is going to go from an outdoor unit to multiple indoor units inside a space. Uh, with that said, though, um, what we're trying to do now. And we just recently released basically all of the information of what we did with our newest refrigerant called R32. Uh, most of the equipment that we have now, it's for today for Mitsubishi, Daikin, Carrier, all the different brands that everybody knows. Uh, but we are trying to go to R32 because we know that it's going to reduce um, the, the GWP, which is the global warming potential, by 30%. Uh, we know that R32 is considered to be a, a more flammable refrigerant, so we're doing testing on it continuously before it's accepted in New York. There's some states in the country that already accepted R32, and we've done some projects with that. So again, we continue to look for ways to, to make our equipment more efficient and safer, and so that it, it, it connects with what we're doing. Uh, elect electrification and decarbonization, but it's been it's been something that we're we've been doing since since 1982, uh, and trying to find products that are going to work with what we're trying to do. We started in Asia, and then we went across all you know Europe, and now we are in North America, and in the the whole world, you know, there's different needs depending on where you're at, but obviously here in the country. We have very specific needs and very specific goals. So that's why we're now working with this new refrigerant, which we're pushing hard to, to make it available so that we can, you know, have all of our equipment with it. Thank you. Laura? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Just in terms of um, what makes each of your companies or past companies, you know, mm -hmm. sustainable, like what makes you different, like how, you know. Oh, sure. Yeah. I thought I could, I don't want to repeat what I kind of said in the introduction, but, you know, really that L&M is, um, you know, being a leader in especially affordable development, um, mm -hmm. focusing on, you know, leapfrogging to passive house, geothermal, fully electric buildings, and now, um, kind of building on that expertise to build at the community level. So we have two um, projects that are like community master plan mm -hmm. that will be um, fully electrified and or net zero. Um, so it's really kind of this progression. Um, so that's why I think we're considered sustainable now. And a lot of what my job is, is around thinking about all the other aspects of what we do and how do we integrate sustainability there. And just curious, are there um, other organizations that you know of, or maybe other organizations that you've worked with that are doing something similar? Um, yeah, you mean like other real estate firms that are doing passive yeah. and things like I, that? Yeah, newcomer. So I'm also yeah. trying to learn too. <laughs> no, no, no. I just want to make sure I understood your question. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, uh, we certainly have lots of great competitors. <laughs> um, but um, I'm just trying to think of a few, you know, I mean, in terms of kind of on the development side, um, which is different than, you know, when we think about electrification and real estate, there's developers, but there's also architects. Yeah, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's a lot of different players here. Um, you know, some folks that are notable in the space, you know, related. Um, Jonathan Rose is a partner of ours and we've done electrification projects with them. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a big field. Yeah, no, um, I am starting a job, uh, next month and I went through the whole interview process where I'm sort of dividing up my potential places into developers and architects and MEP firms and all that. So I wanted to get your insight as to what, I wonder what she's going to say off the top of her head. So you kind of, yeah, yeah, question. no, I was just trying to think of like, which, which, which like group um, you're thinking of, but I mean, there's lots of amazing architects that are doing and other developers. Um, we collaborate with 
Um, Datner has done some really interesting work on the okay. architecture side, but I could go on and on. I don't know. <laughs> no, it's good. I'm, I'm learning something new. That's good. Datner related. Yeah. I would say though, like good resources for that stuff is AIA for the, on the okay. architecture side. Um, AIA, I'm going to write this in the chat so everyone can know. AIA. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the New York chapter does a lot around sustainability. Um, obviously like Passive House New York is a really good local resource um, around architects and designers and things like that who are doing electrified buildings. Um, uh, building Energy Exchange, another really, really great resource of, in New York um, to connect into the industry. Um, and I would say the Northeast um, Sustainable Energy Association is another really great one. That's not just about New York. Um, mm -hmm but um, a, a really good way to, to like learn and meet practitioners, architects, designers, and others who are, who are focused on the space. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Absolutely. I'll put it in the chat. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, speaking of which, cause I know it's kind of, you know, Christina's turn. Um, what other sustainable organizations are we a part of? Is there anyone, if, are there any speakers here who are part of other volunteer groups or chapters, associations? Sure. Yeah. Um, I actually am the founder of an organization called Latinxes in Sustainability, um, which I started in 2017 due to the lack of Latinx representation in, in the sustainability industry. Um, so similar to actually to, to this kind of event, we do a lot of like career talks and just storytelling um, so that people understand like windy career trajectories can sometimes occur, but also kind of allow um, people to share, you know, inequities or biases that lead to those trajectories being so difficult. And, and, and in most cases, it being so difficult to get your foot into these doors um, while everyone is still talking about workforce development constantly. So it's really just trying to elevate those stories so that you know, people in the room can hear and be better allies and 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 help really with workforce development and, and get that diversity that we preach. Um, but in general, I would just say that there there are a lot of, especially in New York, we are like spoiled in the best way that we that there are so many professional organizations to tap into, which for me have been really useful, not just in terms of like professional development and sound, you know, sounding boards, mentors, but I think as I mentioned, like in, in, a, in a field that's constantly evolving, careers are so like niche and amazing. Um, but most people don't even like know what that is, especially like younger people or people that are trying to break into it. Um, so I have found that these type of, of organizations can help like refine like what you're interested in, what you're, you know, what might be your passion, um, who's out there serving at that place um, that might be like a perfect fit for you. Uh, so yeah, I, I know it was in some of the questions we got, but I just am a big advocate for like, seek these opportunities, get involved. Um, I know it's tough sometimes to do things after work, but I think it's it's absolutely worth it. <laughs> and the summer. And I think all of yeah. us uh, Green Home NYC volunteers have uh, got a little taste of that. Mm -hmm. um, no, that's great. And, um, you know, that also segues into another question for everyone here is, you know, what sort of accreditations, credits, classes, ways can we kind of keep up to date bolster our resumes, not in a formal way, but I just mean like, what are the ways in which we can kind of keep up to date, be ahead of the game? You know, what is it that we do? And what is it that you, Laura and Eric do in your spare time to make sure you are kind of kept on your feet for lack of a better term? Um, Eric, do you want to take a stab at this? So maybe it's more of an engineering question, I think. Yeah. Um, so there, there is obviously a lot of different things that we can do. Um, I just put on the on the chat um, Ashley, which is um, big for what we do. There, there is several um, certifications that somebody in the industry can attain uh, within Ashley, um, and you know, anybody that is able to add that to the resume, you know, obviously that speaks for itself, you know, in, in, in the kind of preparation this person has taken. <clears throat> um, Ashley, obviously, you know, 
in the mechanical code in New York City follows ASHRAE guidelines. So any, any time that you can prepare yourself or get any of the certifications from ASHRAE, uh, that means that you are well prepared. People, people know that, people listen. Um, so for us, for example, in the HVAC ventilation geothermal world, it, there's just a lot of different things that we can do. Uh, and, you know, we are fortunate at Daikin that, you know, they offer all these different trainings or they send us to wherever we need to go. But I know it's the same for everyone, even if you don't work for a manufacturer like Daikin, you know, like just local contractors. Um, it, there is different things, you know, um, obviously for engineers, you know, you, you have to maintain your, um, your, your accreditation by taking PDH classes and things like that throughout, you know, the course of a year and things like that. So, and it, it's always good to be looking for things like that. Daikin offers PDH classes for engineers, which is something that I, I'm very happy that we do that. So there's just several ways. It's just a matter of, of, of looking for it, but I would strongly recommend ASHRAE for people that are in the industry and taking some of those certifications as well. Just wrote it in the chat. I did not know about these. Did I get that right, Eric, PDH classes? Yeah. Okay. Did not know that. There's really just such a multitude of academic, you know, information and availability to people. And I slowly began to realize that when I was segueing into the civilian sector. And I just love hearing about this stuff. Anything from Christina or Laura, as far as similar PDH classes or classes or trainings or anything of the sort at your companies? You know, folks ask me, like, how do I learn about sustainability or green buildings? And I think, that, you know, there's lots of good resources out there. You know, I listed some in the chat. Um, you know, obviously, LEAD, you know, is also another resource. So, um, but I would say that, you know, similar to the comment about, like, grad school, like, pursue the certifications if you have a specific like use and need for them. You know, I think like someone who has no work experience at all, but has like uh, some certification for something, it's like, okay, well, <laughs> maybe you should be the, it's not gonna get, it's not probably gonna get you unless it's a very specific technical thing. That yeah. You're if it's more general and you're kind of trying to figure it out, I think it's more about like getting, getting in somewhere, like start somewhere. There's so many places to get started. Mm -hmm. There's so much work that has to get done. So you can leverage kind of like whatever background you have to kind of get, get started somewhere. And then it'll be much more clear once you get started. Oh, you know what? Like, I really need to get my CEM, you know, mm -hmm. to move forward. But I think if you're just starting out, it's hard to really know that unless you have a very specific vision, you know. It's tough to um, navigate waters when they're going to be muddy, right? Like there's no way of going about it. You just kind of have to swim further before the waters get clear. That's how I felt with Mm -hmm. you know, my, uh, my introduction into the real world. And I'm sure there might be people here today who are probably thinking the same thing. So you gotta kind of do like a little shot in the dark thing. And Christina, anything from you? Yeah, I would just, I totally agree with Laura. Um, but I would add that a lot of firms will pay for certifications. Um, that's, I don't really know that any of my certifications have, have come in handy when like making the next jump. Um, but like when I was in construction, they paid for my lead one. So I was like, okay, if it's free, I'll do it. Um, while at the mayor's office, they paid for my CEM. So, I mean, it's things that maybe haven't helped yet, but they might in the future, they certainly don't hurt. Um, and if they're being covered by your, by your, you know, company, then I think it's worth, you know, pers pursuing it. Um, at least, you know, it's somewhat related to like the pathway you're going. If it's like something completely random, then maybe that's not worth your time. Um, but then they probably not pay for it if it's so random. Uh, but yeah, it's something <laughs> to just inquire about, like what, you know, what continuing education and maybe it's not a certificate, maybe it's a course. Um, but that's always something to, to look into. What can your company offer you? Mm -hmm. yeah. Perfect. And, it, and just like a, so like a, like a, a career events around the stuff, I like to shout out working for utilities, <laughs> which I think, you know, um, is not obvious choice for a lot of people, but um, you get a ton of exposure to all of kind of the framework of everything that we're talking about. And, you know, utilities are incredibly influential 
um, for lots of obvious reasons, but also, you know, when we're talking specific, specifically about building electrification or transportation electrification, it's like all reliance on the grid, right? So you can get a lot of exposure to these things, but oftentimes, and they know, you know, specifically around the New York based utilities, they have incredible education programs. Um, and also a lot of opportunity. These are big organizations that have a lot of different departments and a lot of opportunity to work around departments. So you start somewhere and then you end up somewhere else. You know, a lot of people I know who work at utilities have held, held like five different positions. <laughs> and it's not because they didn't like their positions because they're actually getting moved around the company to learn more. Um, so just like a, a shout out for utilities <laughs> work. It can be a really great way to kick off your career. There's a reason why we have these forums, Laura, right? We have these events. So yes, please bring on the shout outs. I got Eric here, uh, you know, marketing himself for these PDH classes. So I appreciate that. Um, so we're about five minutes from the last 20 minutes of the event where I really should be reading off my uh, Q&A chat box right here to address any questions that haven't been addressed yet. So kind of saving the best for last, right, for each of you. So whoever wants to go first, and then of course the second and third speaker follows after. So my question is, um, uh, if you could go back in time, right, what would you do differently? And I'm leaving it open-ended because maybe it is bringing back a memory or an anecdote or a time when you kind of thought like, oh, like I could have done this differently. And again, not to highlight people's mistakes, but more so to highlight what you have learned. So that's a question. And then of course, second kind of easy one, like what do you have to say to the group? Like any advice on anyone who wishes to be a Laura, Christina or an Eric, we would love to hear that. So hopefully that was uh, as clear and concise as can be. So whoever wants to go first. Yeah, I, oh, Christina, you wanna go? I, you go first. Um, well, one thing I wish I kind of knew um, heading into work in general is that um, at least for me, and I think for a lot of people that your career, your work life is actually where you can learn a lot about yourself and a lot about your strengths and your weaknesses in ways that are really unexpected. Like if you had asked me when I graduated, when I stepped out of my full graduation hat at my undergrad, what I was good at, what I was bad at, you know, I was wrong. <laughs> I would have been wrong, <laughs> like from where I'm standing right now. And so I think being really open to that and being aware of where you're excelling and where you're not and really accepting that you're gonna be best when you can play to your strengths. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of people, and I think particularly a lot of women have this pressure to be perfect at everything and to not have any weaknesses when, when it comes to work. Um, and that's a, that's a losing game. No one's perfect. The, the most powerful, amazing CEOs and whoever in our industries or any industry, like they're successful because they've surrounded by themselves with people that complement their strengths and their weaknesses, not mm -hmm. because they can do everything on their own. Mm -hmm. And I think kind of having that perspective as you grow in your career and learn things about yourself can help you surround yourself by, with the team, the people and the network um, that complement your strengths. Um, and um, and can help you also figure out, okay, what position is really right for me? Like, where am I gonna be able to shine? And where can I help other people shine that are really different for me in terms of strengths and weaknesses? So that's something I wish I'd had that perspective like early on. Um, and, you know, I would say in terms of advice, like, you know, for people who are starting out, I think just in general, aside from just being open to like where you start, because there's so many entry paths, there's consulting, there's policy, there's development, there's tech, there's utility. I mean, there's like, there's so many different ways to enter. So really any background that you're starting with right now, academic or otherwise, there's like an entry point somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. But I think it's about getting started and having a clear sense of your vision. Where, what are you trying to do here? Mm -hmm. um, but then being really willing and able to revise that vision as you learn. Mm -hmm. But I think it's like, you have to always have like a, you know, a North star that you're pointed towards. Mm -hmm. The North Star may shift here and there over time, but if you lose sight of that, it mm -hmm. can be really easy to kind of get lost um, in your job, in your company, in your company, wherever, wherever you might be. Mm -hmm. That is so true too, because sustainability or climate resiliency, whatever that term is that people think of is so large and broad. 
right? And some people who are segueing into the sector have no idea where to even start. So I appreciate you saying that about your North Star analogy. And then in addition, I mean, this is just me, but me being surrounded by people who complement my strengths and my best attributes is probably the way to go. So I do appreciate you saying that just as a friendly reminder to everyone to surround yourself with people who are going to bring the best out in you. Um, okay, whoever's next. Sure. Um, well, first I would, I, I wish that I would have sought more mentors. I think there are so many people in this space that um, are willing to help younger people or anyone navigate this industry. Um, you just need to seek them out. And for some reason I didn't, but looking back on it, it's like, if I was going to, you know, if I'm going to cook a dish that I've never cooked, I'm going to like look up the recipe. And, and that's kind of the same thing, right? Like why reinvent the wheel, seek someone that's done this before. Um, and, and I'm sure they'll help out. The other thing is that I wish, you know, as I mentioned, I, I started in construction and it felt like I didn't start my sustainability career until I was 27. And in my head, I was like, Oh my God, what have I been doing up till now? I'm so late. Um, and that's couldn't be like further from the truth. Um, but I wish I would have known how to advocate for myself that there are so many lessons and skills learned in jobs that although they're not, you know, climate change, sustainability, there are still a lot of valuable things that I took from that. And, and I'm not just talking about like my, you know, first real job out of college, which was in the construction industry, which I did, you know, have a lot of, learn a lot of project management, but even in like my college jobs that were, you know, not like totally random. Like I worked at a doctor's office for five years and at a restaurant, but there's still a lot of skills, you know, when working with people um, and managing deadlines, like there's a lot that I could have pulled from that, that I had no idea that I should have. Um, and I wish that I would have better advocated for myself. And I also like to tell that story because I hope that like decision makers in the audience also kind of look back and, and look at like when you're looking at especially, you know, junior positions and fresh out of college people like looking at their resume, like try to look at the whole picture. Um, like if someone worked at the Foot Locker on 42nd Street, like they're bringing a lot of skills because they're able to manage that, like try to, and, and oftentimes those decisions about you know, college jobs, college internships are, are based on like socioeconomic factors. So yeah, I just really strongly hope that people can can start to look at the, the full picture. Because again, that first job is so um, just so indicative of, 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 you know, where a career might take you. I'm going to remember that when I start my job, September 12th, <laughs> Christina. So thank you. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right, Eric, best for last. So uh, one thing I would like to say is, um, you know, and people will know what I'm talking about here. Um, a lot of times people tell you don't, you know, jumping around from job to job might not be the best thing that you can do. But, but I feel that sometimes when you do, you get the opportunity to work with different people, to learn from different people, and to see if your career is stuck, you know, and, and, so that's something that I did myself. You know, I I, I moved around because I wanted to learn more. But if if I can do something different, is that I, I feel that at some point in my career I felt that I like I knew it all, <laughs> and I wasn't very good at listening to other people. Um, and, and it took a while to understand that you know the trade the industry was just continuing to move, and I was kind of staying behind. Uh, so I, I think it's it's a good thing to to listen. You know, listen to the people around you. Um, sometimes just even listening to building owners. I mean, learning what their pains are, what they deal with in a daily basis, instead of just trying to get there and tell them what they need to do. If you listen to what they need, then maybe you'll come up with something better as to what they need, regardless of what the, what the law is, what the code is. I mean, you, you have to listen to these building owners. Um, they, they hold the key to this, you know, because they, they're in these buildings every single day. So um, as a suggestion for people is learn everything that you can, um, talk to people. Um, mentors is it's a great thing. Um, I have a few throughout my career, but always keep your eyes and ears open because you know if if you don't, then you're gonna fall behind. That, that's my opinion. Wow, I'm writing a lot down. Good, thank you, Eric. Um, so it's right now 7.43, we have about 17 minutes left. Um, you know, I have been reading from the group chat, so I'm going to address any questions that I haven't. 
So since we ended with Eric, I'm actually going to start with Eric as far as uh, two questions from Raul for Eric. And then I will, of course, address Matthew Sarker, if you're still here. I will address your question from earlier right afterwards. So with that, two questions for Eric. This is from Raul. You mentioned that the first deadline for Local Law 97 is in 2024. I read somewhere that the real estate industry is super behind in meeting Local Law 97 requirements. One, do you agree with this assessment? And two, do you think that the industry will therefore pressure the mayor and city council to lower forgive the penalties or push the deadlines way back? Um, I do understand, Eric, that I think you wrote something to as a response to that, but I think the rest of us kind of want to hear your answer as well. Yeah, um, well, uh, 2024 is like tomorrow, right? I mean, we're, we're almost there. So uh, yeah, we are we are behind and, and we see that uh, every single day, you know, when we're talking to our engineers and we go and do job site visits, you know, uh, buildings are behind. <clears throat> and I, I do understand from what I hear that, you know, we're already talking about what exceptions we're gonna have. Uh, whether we're going to push these deadlines or just find a common ground for people. And I, I do understand that as long as a building is able to, to, to show that you are doing something to get to those numbers, then the fines will not be the same or they might be, you know, uh, they, they might wait on that. So I, I know there is, there is some leeway there. Uh, especially now as we're getting so close to 2024. And I think, um, you know, we're starting to see that we're nowhere close to where we need to be. So uh, I do believe that there is going to be some change in that as we get closer to 2024. Uh, but a lot of it is, is, is to be seen still. Thank you, Eric. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very curious and there's so much that can happen between of course now and then, although you are right when you said 2024 is literally right around the corner, so. Uh, we got one, here we go, Matthew Sarker. Okay, um, and then I got a question from Bill. So I'm gonna address Matthew's first question, which was back about 30 minutes ago. So this question is for Laura. Um, can you speak to what you've learned in making a decarbonization strategy for your firm's buildings and pain points that you are running into? In parentheses, he also wrote, it doesn't seem like New York City public buildings have an aggressive strategy yet. So I'm wondering if public sector can learn from private, question mark. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think with decarbonization strategy as like a general principle, um, I think it's really important to understand, you know, you know, what are the levers that you can pull to reduce carbon, you know, so in, in this case, we're talking a lot about switching out boilers um, <laughs> for, for heat pumps of some flavor. Um, right, so that's the thing that you have to do. But then you have to really think about like, how are you going to do that? You know, and, and some of it's technical, but honestly, I think the hardest stuff is actually the stuff that's not technical. Like the good thing about engineers is that they can solve pretty much any problem that you have <laughs> um, from a technical perspective, right? Like there's never a building that just cannot be electrified, right? They, they all can. There's always a technical solution. And we're lucky right now that technology is getting so good and and new new components and new varieties. And you know, Eric could talk about all the cool stuff coming from Daikin and others in the industry. It's evolving constantly, right? So the technical stuff isn't the hurdle. It's all of the like how, um, you know, from uh, and and mainly like financial um, is is the real is the real sticking point. Um, you know, how do we make the the financial case to do these things? Where you know, again, right now, like historically energy efficiency has had pretty straightforward paybacks, you know, that you could kind of count on. You use less energy, you spend less money, and, you know, it's pretty, it was never that easy, but it was pretty straightforward. And now it's this, this really new dynamic, um, local law 97 and other legislation, like what is this going to mean? Um, you know, so I think that those are the, pain, that that's like the primary pain point. Um, trying to kind of future-proof buildings in, in a world that isn't really incentivizing us to do that yet, um, or not fully. Um, you know, I would say actually in New York City that, you know, the private sector 
um, for real estate is talking a really big game. And I'm really excited about what, especially some of like the big global real estate firms are talking about doing in terms of sustainability. I think there's a lot of question marks in terms of like how the retrofits are actually going to happen though. And Christina probably has, and, and Eric probably has some good insights there. Um, and I actually think the public sector has been really useful in DCAS as an entity in particular of using their buildings um, to demonstrate that some of this stuff is feasible and is possible and like using it as um, testing grounds for a lot of the um, a lot of the equipment that we're talking about, a lot of the heat pumps and other types of um, you know, measures that we have to implement um, to decarbonize these buildings. Um, so, um, but that being said, you know, um, I think it's all about, you know, it, yeah, honestly, I think in a lot of ways that the public sector is actually showing the private sector <laughs> how to do this, <laughs> um, you know, yeah. Thank you. Um, appreciate the candor there. And of course, you kind of already mentioned it to Christina and Eric as far as like, how do you retrofit a building, right? So what are some... I don't know, examples. What are some stories? What are some pain points for Christina and Eric in regards to their profession, what they do when it comes to retrofitting? Oh, Eric, do you want to take that? Um, sure. Um, I was just thinking right now uh, without getting too political because this is not you know, <laughs> what we're trying to do here, but um, I'm really curious as to know how this new Inflation Reduction Act is going to help. Uh, the government is talking about this $369 billion, I believe it is, that they're going to invest in uh, domestic energy production and manufacturing and reducing carbon emissions by, I believe, 40% by 2030, which is, what, 80 years from now? Uh, but I think to, to Laura's point, it's, it's not the technology, it's not what we have to make make this happen it's how we get it done so I, I i do hope that some of this money they're talking about is going to go in that direction because i think that's where the biggest disconnect is um, in terms of an example you know the, the one that comes to mind is um the flat iron building in new york city uh, we we did cooling and heating for that building with water cooled vrv units from daikin uh, they had a big problem with not being able to fit just regular equipment up in the roof. Um, obviously, we all know that building is a very unique shaped building and not a lot of space. So we were able to utilize the water here and 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 do comfort for this for this building with water cooled VRV. Um, and, and there's other examples. It's, it's just us trying to use what we have and what the building offers and, and trying to get there. Um, but again, it, it's easier said than done, right? Um, and that's what we're all working on. Christina? Sure. Um, I don't have, you know, specific examples because we know I, I don't work directly with building owners. Um, as I mentioned, we work with, with, with local city government. But yeah, I think there's there's a lot of challenges thinking about how exactly this this gets implemented and rolled out. I think some of the some of that has been has been discussed already, like cost, who's going to pay for this, but also you know is the workforce trained um, to do these installs to do them correctly? There's a lot of concerns about you know like refrigerant leakage, so we want to make sure that these jobs are 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 done really really well. Um, so I think that's something that we think of when we're thinking of like, you know, electrifying an entire city is, is the workforce prepared? How do we make sure that they get prepared? And I think, you know, as Laura mentioned, like in New York City, where DCAS is kind of going first, I think examples like that, where there's like phasing um, that can occur and, and starting with, um, you know, maybe like buildings that have more resources or city, you know, municipal buildings that can lead by example um, is an, is an interesting, interesting take. Um, but then also kind of recognizing that with that, we want to make sure that as we learn and as things are phased, we're also not leaving behind, um, you know, maybe communities that cannot, um, you know, bear the cost of this because that can lead to, you know, increased gas prices and then more, you know, unreliable um, gas infrastructure. Um, so it's just a lot of, it, 
just to say there's a lot to consider all at once. Um, and again, I think that's just, yes, it's gonna be difficult to figure out exactly how this gets rolled out. Obviously no city has been fully electrified. Um, so we're gonna have to be creative, but again, I just to go back to what I said before, like it requires a lot of collaboration of, you know, stakeholders that bring, you know, their unique expertise um, in order for us to do this as as smoothly as possible. And, and even then I think there's gonna be hiccups, but you know, they're they're hopefully learning experiences. Mm -hmm. Very true. Um, I would like to think that is the case with, you know, whether it's Laura's job, Eric's job, your job, any really of our jobs, it's really everyone uh, speaking from the same sheet of music, for lack of a better term. Um, so we're about five minutes out from 8 p.m. Um, one thing I want to ask of the speakers is please, if you don't mind, writing an email or a way or a website that we can that some of the participants here can reach out to you. For example, I'm gonna reach out to Eric here in a moment because I have a question and a request for him after something that he said. Um, you know, and then anything else that you would find informative. I know that many of you have already kind of chatted certain organizations, associations, chapters to look into, but you know, if you don't mind, emails would be helpful as well. So thank you. And, um, you know, uh, I'm the only one off of mute, but a little round of applause for Laura, Christina, and Eric. Thank you so, so much for joining us today and uh, sharing with us your thoughts, whether it were my questions, the audience's questions, volunteers' questions. It's always really helpful. And I love being here to learn something new, um, you know, every couple months here with Green Careers. Um, with that, I'm just going to give a little reminder to everyone, uh, just repeating something from earlier, our next event is uh, September 13th, um, Women Entrepreneurs in Sustainability from same time, 6.30 to 8 p.m. And then I'm going to solicit backup from either Lucy or Emily or Mayank. I forget when our volunteer meetings are. Um, I would also like to relay that to the team here today. I'm going to see if anyone responds to me quickly. I'm going to look it up here shortly. I want to say yeah, our, yeah. Thank uh, you, Lizzie. our volunteer orientations are every third Wednesday of the month from 545 to 630. They're right before our uh, forums events. And you can go to event.com, look for Green Home NYC, and we always have the next volunteer orientation available there. You can also find that on Green Home NYC on the first page, you will find a link to volunteer with us. Awesome, thank you, Lucy. I didn't have that in my notes here. Um, yeah, so uh, that kind of concludes the Green Careers events on building electrification. I believe we covered a lot. Everyone was speaking a lot, answering questions, staying attentive. So there are no rules, right? So if there's anyone here who is attending who would like to personally ask Christina, Laura, or Eric a question, um, introduce yourself. If you're interested in volunteering, of course, please unmute yourselves, unvideo yourselves. We would love to hear from you. Um, there are no rules. Um, so with that, everyone have a very, very great evening. We're ending a few minutes early. Um, if I forgot anything, um, please let me know, Lucy, Emily, or Miyank. All other than that, have a great evening. And uh, Laura, I think you got to go, right? So good luck, do your thing. And I will be here to answer any questions. Thanks, guys. Bye.